Well, it's great being with all of you here at End Times with Pastor Eric. We've got a lot to cover here today. Now, we are in our part four of refuting preterism, talking about its problems and helping people understand how to refute it. Now, last time we were together in part three, we talked about the phrase that many preterists use to try to claim that the Olivet Discourse and much of the Book of Revelation had to occur in the year 70 AD. And that was the phrase, this generation, that Jesus uses in his Olivet Discourse. We prove that this generation is actually a pejorative. It does not have to do with the quantity of people living during a certain time, but a quality of people. Namely, people who are characterized by unbelief and the hatred of God's prophets. That's what we showed. So it doesn't matter when you live. If you're an unbeliever, you're part of this generation. That's what we proved last time exegetically. Now, this time, what I want to do in part four is we got a lot to cover. Number one, I want to lay out the future 70th week of Daniel and show you that the parousia cannot possibly be in 70 AD. Okay, remember the parousia is the technical term for the return of Christ. And I'm going to show you that indeed the future parousia is in the future 70th week of Daniel. Second, we're going to address some more issues that preterists will throw at you. One is Matthew 10, 23, where Jesus says that the disciples would not finish going through the cities of Israel until the Son of Man comes. I'm going to show you that this does not mean that the parousia occurred in 70 AD, and I'll prove it to you exegetically. Uh, third, we're going to look at the phrase in Matthew 16, 28, where Jesus says, some standing here will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his glory. Okay, I'm going to show you that that's fulfilled not at 70 AD, but immediately at the Mount of Transfiguration. And it's obvious because it's in all three synoptics. Uh, fourth, we're going to look at Matthew 26, 64, another phrase that preterists will use to try to dupe us into thinking that all of the eschatology Jesus taught must happen in 70 AD. Matthew 26, 64, Jesus before the high priest said, you have said it yourself. Nevertheless, he says, I tell you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. They believe that that happened in 70 AD. I'll prove to you that no, they're not understanding the text. They're doing poor exegesis. Finally, we're going to be coming to kind of a conclusion regarding preterism, and I'm going to liken it to Hymenaeus and Philetus, who taught that the resurrection had already come, and I'll show you why. So we got a lot to cover. I don't mean to talk so fast, but I want to try to keep these to around 35, 40 minutes. Let's get started straight away. And I want to get back to something we talked about last time, and that was the structure of the Olivet Discourse. The Olivet Discourse shows us that these things have to happen in the future. That is the 70th week of Daniel. Now, what I want to show you is that there are, again, two questions, as we talked about last time, that the disciples asked. They asked first, when will these things be? And second, they asked, what will be the sign of your coming? Again, the term coming in Greek is parousia. I use the term parousia there so that you see the technical term. So those two questions were related. They believe the disciples, because they're on the Mount of Olives, the very location that, according to Zechariah 14, will witness the final battle. That is, I believe it's the culmination of the Battle of Armageddon, that the nations will surround Jerusalem, and that's when the Messiah would come and fight for them. And I believe, as Jesus talks about the destruction of the temple, that's what's in their mind. Why? Because remember, when Jesus left the temple in Matthew 23, just the previous section, he talks about his coming. He said, you will not see me again until, remember the until can't be for a non-event, until you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of Yahweh. He cites the Messianic Psalm from Psalm 118. Okay, so it's about his coming. That's what he left off with. So they're assuming Jesus talking about his coming as he's going to destroy the enemy surrounding Jerusalem as written about in Zechariah 14. That's why they are asking these questions. And remember what I mentioned last time is that Jesus answers the questions in reverse order. He begins with the second question and he answers that first. So Jesus, let me pull up my pointer. What he does is he gives you all of the signs 
of the future 70th week of Daniel from Matthew 24 verses 4 through 35. Every single sign he gives is within the parentheses of the 70th week. There is nothing prior. None of these signs are those things that are happening during the church age. Now, as I say that, I know people will say, well, yeah, well, there's always been wars and rumors of wars. Yeah, but not that led to a quarter of the earth's destruction. Okay, the reason the wars are so spectacular and function as signs in the future 70th week is because so many people die. It is so horrific. It leads to the destruction of much of the world. That's the idea. Now, then Jesus is going to answer the first question last, and that is, when will these things be? Jesus says four, five, six different ways no one knows. Not the angels of heaven, but even, uh, not even the Son, but only the Father who is in heaven. Okay, so that's the structure of the Olivet Discourse. And so last time I talked about how all of the signs are within Matthew 24, 4 through 35. You will not see a single sign regarding the Olivet Discourse in the 70th week of Daniel after verse 35. So all the signs, and I'm just giving you the kind of the highlights here. Again, the worst wars, famines, earthquakes ever. That's in verses 4 through 7. Verse 8, again, birth pangs. Odin is the technical term. You see that alluded to by Isaiah the prophet. That's why Jesus is using it. It's a reference to the day of the Lord. Paul talks about the same term using Odin, same term Jesus does, referring to the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord comes while people are saying peace and safety, sun destruction comes upon them like what? Like labor pains. That's 1 Thessalonians 5.3. Where did Paul the apostle get that? He got it from Jesus and the Olivet Discourse. The time period that's being described here is the day of the Lord, the time of God's wrath on all unbelievers. But it's also the time of salvation for God's people. Uh, notice we also have in Matthew 24, 15, the abomination of desolation. Could Jesus be any clearer? He says, so when you see the abomination that causes desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, well, that's in the 70th week of Daniel. That's not something that's happening during the church age. So obviously these signs are within the future 70th week of Daniel. They didn't happen in 70 AD. I won't labor that point anymore. I've already talked about that regarding 2 Thessalonians 2.8. Okay, now again, I'm just giving you a summary. Matthew 24, 21 through 22, Jesus says this is the worst time period ever. Lo and behold, Revelation 6 through 19, those chapters talk about the worst time period ever. Why? Because what Jesus is describing is synonymous with Revelation chapter 6 through 19. The worst time period ever, the future 70th week of Daniel. Okay, um, we could go on. Matthew 24, 29 through 31, we have cosmic signs, Christ himself regathering the people of Israel into their kingdom. All of this is talked about where Jesus is describing the signs, answering the second question first from Matthew 24, verses 4 through 35. Okay, now what I want to show you, and I'm gonna, I got a handy dandy timeline here is notice now Jesus, when you get to verse 36, he answers the first question, when will these things be? That is, when will the 70th week of Daniel come? Well, let's go down to my timeline. Notice the timeline here that I have begins with the first advent of Christ, signified by the cross. We are now living in the church age. When will that end? We don't know. But when it does end, it will end with the future seven years or 70th week of Daniel, the last week of years if you're familiar with Daniel chapter 9. Okay, so this is my handy dandy diagram for that. Notice the first three and a half years would begin there and end here. That's where the Antichrist sets himself up in the temple, declares himself to be God. Then he will be destroyed by the return of Christ here at the end of the 70th week. What I'm laying out is the entire seven year period is the parousia. So, the way this works is notice Jesus, when you get to verse 36 of Matthew 24, he uses the term peri day, which is literally rendered now concerning. It shows a topic change that is related to the previous topic. But nonetheless, it's a topic change. Why? Because now he's going to answer, well, when will these things be? And how many different ways does Jesus have to say, no one knows? Matthew 24, 36. So now he's not talking about the signs. All the signs were within this time period. Now he's talking about the beginning of it, the beginning of the 70th week. And what does he say? He says, no one knows. In fact, in Matthew 24, 37, he says, it's sudden like 
Noah's day. Remember, in Noah's day, there was nothing to tip the people off that there was going to be a flood. All they had was the preaching of Noah. All the people have in our day during the church age is the preaching of the gospel. They have the sign of Jonah, which is the resurrection. And how do we know of the sign of Jonah? It's through our Bible. That's how we know it. I'm trying to get it in the frame there. Sorry. That's how we know it. It's only through the preaching. That's the exact same situation that people in our day and age are in. So that's why the parousia is like Noah's day. It's sudden. That's why Jesus says, he says they were eating and drinking and giving in marriage. Let's ask the question, is giving in marriage, is that a sin? No, according to Paul, anyone who forbids marriage is teaching a doctrine of demons. So of course it's not sinful to get married. Jesus was describing life as it always went on. The people were absolutely shocked. Why? Because the wrath of God came suddenly upon them without warning. That's the way it's going to be at Christ parousia. The 70th week of Daniel will come upon them suddenly. That's the idea that he's conveying. Matthew 24, 43, Jesus says it will happen suddenly like a thief. The very same term that Paul uses in 1 Thessalonians 5, 2. The day of the Lord comes like a thief. While they're saying peace and safety, sudden destruction comes upon them like what? Labor pains. Odin, the same term Jesus used in Matthew 24, 8. Okay, so it's going to be suddenly like a thief. By the way, in Greek, there were two terms that could be used for thief. One was leistes. That would be a robber who would use force. He's the one who would beat you over the head with a club. But the other term was kleptes. Kleptes was the thief that relied upon stealth. That's the term that Jesus uses here. Why is he using a term regarding stealth? Because you have no idea when the 70th week of Daniel is going to begin. You have no idea. I don't either. No one does. That's what Jesus began with. He says, now concerning the day and the hour, no one knows. So if anyone says, well, I think I know when Jesus is coming, they don't. Why? Because Jesus said they don't. So either you're going to believe Jesus or you're going to believe some false teacher. But no one knows. No one has any idea when it's going to happen. Okay? That's the idea that we see. So in many different ways, Jesus shows us that there's no way to know. In fact, he likens his arrival the beginning of the 70th week, like the sudden arrival of a master of a home. So Jesus cannot be any clearer that we have no idea as to when the 70th week of Daniel is going to come forth. So think of it this way. In Matthew 24, 4 through 35, remember that's from this chiastic structure here, there are signs within the last seven years that you can know. So if you're a person that's living during those last seven years, you're going to have lots of signs to look at. But then Jesus answers the question, well, when will these things be? And there, he's saying no one knows. In other words, when does the beginning of the 70th week come? You have no idea. Okay, so one of the problems that I see in evangelicalism is we have tons of prophecy conferences and the people are taking the signs that are exclusive to being in the 70th week, the future seven years, and they place them in the church age. That's why they keep trying to guess when this is going to happen. Remember, there was that joker who said there was 88 reasons why Jesus had to return in 1988. Well, Jesus says no one knows. No one knows the day or the hour. The day and the hour, by the way, is synonymous with the day of the Lord. No, no one knows when the day of God's wrath will come. Okay, so again, Matthew 24, 36 through 51 is talking about the inception or the beginning of the 70th week. And you have no signs for that in the church age. Once you are inside the 70th week, again, which is synonymous with the parousia, then you have tons of signs. What I am arguing is that the parousia of Christ is a complex event. It, it did not happen in 70 AD. It's never happened during church history. But one day in the future, the parousia, the return of Christ, is a seven-year complex event. Now, let me go on to prove that to you. I've mentioned this numerous times, and I'll be doing this in further messages, but I want to hit it here to show you that the post-millennialists and those who claim preterism don't have a leg to stand on in saying that the parousia happened in 70 AD. They don't know what they're talking about. They're not seeing the biblical data. So the amillennialists, they'll say, well, Jesus' parousia is a one-day event. It happens in one day, and so they'll mock those who believe that in fact the rapture occurs first, there are seven years of wrath followed by Jesus returning at the end. 
No, it's not a one-day event. It's a complex event. I'll prove it to you exegetically. Post-millennialists, often them, they will say that Jesus came spiritually in 70 AD. No, the text of Scripture never teaches that. He's coming bodily. Remember, the disciples, they're told by the angel standing next to them at the Mount of Olives in Acts chapter 1 as Jesus ascends. They said, men of Galilee, why do you gaze skyward? This same Jesus is coming back in like manner. Did Jesus leave spiritually or bodily? Well, of course he left bodily. How is he going to return? Guess what? <laughs> it's bodily. That's right. So the preterists who are often post-millennialists who claim, though, he came spiritually in a form in 70 AD, it's not true. That's not true. Okay. Now, let me make the link and show you why we know that the last seven years is in fact the parousia of Christ. There's a parallel construction between Luke 17, 26, which is an eschatological passage. It is about the end. And notice it says here, and just as it happened in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days, plural, of the Son of Man. What's very interesting is this is exactly what Jesus teaches in his Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, verse 37. In fact, it's identical word for word almost in the Greek, except one big change. Notice where it says the days. And by the way, Jesus probably taught this numerous times. Notice Matthew 24, 37. Here it's identical word for word according to Luke 17, 26, except what you see in blue. Matthew 24, 37, Jesus says, for the parousia of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. Okay, now why is that so important? Well, I want you to notice that the days plural here in Luke 17, 26 is synonymous with the parousia singular in Matthew 24, 37. In other words, they are identical. So it is fair to say that the days plural that Jesus is referring to of the Son of Man in Luke 17, 26 is synonymous with the parousia, the term that is the technical term for the coming of Christ. That's the term coming that you see here. So do you see then that the parousia is in fact a plurality of days? So why are amillennialists, I, I know many of them that I've listened to, they're saying, well, the parousia, the coming is only on one day. Well, that would be news to Jesus because the biblical data suggests that no, in fact, the parousia is a plurality of days. Let's ask ourselves the question, did Jesus come his first time in one day? Was his full first advent completed in one day? No, it was a complex of events. It begins, of course, with the virgin birth, but then Jesus grows in wisdom. Uh, he becomes of age. He enters into his three-year uh, ministry, his earthly ministry. He ends up being crucified, dies, buried, raised from the dead ascends into the heavens, fulfilling Psalm 110.1, he sends the Holy Spirit. That's a complex event. In the same way, the second advent of Christ is not a one-day event. It's in fact synonymous with the 70th week of Daniel. That's how I think we should understand it. Okay, so the parousia is in fact a complex event. I, I think, again, it's synonymous with the 70th week of Daniel. And I'll, again, I'll show you more evidence of this at other times. And this, is, this explains why in some texts you see Jesus destroying the Antichrist at the end of the 70th week. That's the parousia. Other times he's going to rapture his church at the beginning of the 70th week, is, which is what? It's part of the parousia. So no matter what he does within that 70th week, it's all part of the parousia. Why? Because the parousia is the seven-year 70th week of Daniel. That's the idea that we're being taught in the scriptures. The 70th week of Daniel is synonymous with the beginning of the day of the Lord. Okay, so the day of the Lord and the parousia are all happening at the same time. All right, they are in fact synonymous. That's the idea. Now think of Luke 17, 26 through 30. Both Noah and Lot, if you read that whole section, Noah and Lot are removed prior to God's wrath. Now why does Jesus teach that? Because that's the precedent. The precedent is that the people of God are removed, then the wrath of God comes. So when does the wrath of God come? It comes in the 70th week of Daniel. How do we know that? 
Well, by the fourth seal, you have sword, famine, pestilence, wild beast, according to Revelation 6.8, which wipe out a quarter of the earth's population. That was explicitly stated as being God's wrath in Ezekiel 14, verses 19 through 21. God used to pour it upon Jerusalem because of their sin. Now he's going to pour it upon the world in the future 70th week of Daniel. Certainly it's the wrath of God. So what is Jesus giving us the expectation? Well, just as Noah and Lot, who were godly because they were believers, just as they were removed prior to God's wrath, so too will the people of God in the future be removed. Then the wrath comes. Okay, that's exactly Christ's point. In Luke 17, 26 through 30, we see the same idea really in John 14, 1 through 3. Remember there Jesus says he's going to go to prepare a place for us in the Father's house. And he says, if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you to myself. Paralambano, a very tender term, Christ receiving us alongside himself so that where he is, we're going to be there also. Where is that? Well, it's in heaven. Why? Because that's when the wrath of God will be poured out. And we're going to be removed just as Noah and Lot were. Where are we going to be removed to? Well, we're going to be brought to heaven. Where, where is the Father's house? Okay, Jesus was going somewhere. Where was he going? Was he, was he going to the local temple? No, he was going to die and then ascend after his resurrection. He was going to ascend to be with the Father. That's what he's talking about initially in John 14. And he comes again to receive us to himself. Why? Because we're going to be spared the wrath of God. The 70th week of Daniel, dear ones, begins with the rapture of the church, the removal of the people of God, just as Jesus promised would happen, just like Noah and Lot were removed. Then the wrath is poured out during that seven years. At the end of the parousia, it's still part of the parousia, the whole thing is the parousia, Jesus returns with the church his people to destroy the enemy surrounding Jerusalem and sets up his kingdom. The entirety of the 70th week of Daniel, that last seven years, is the parousia, the return of Christ. That's how we should understand it. That's the data. Okay. Now, we're going to prove more of that later, but what I want to do is after I show you that affirmatively, I want to talk about some of the negative ideas that the preterists have. The preterists are trying to take the parousia and they're trying to shoehorn it into happening in 70 AD. Of, of course, the full preterists believe that's all there is. 70 AD happened, there's no other future return of Christ. Partial preterists, at least, do believe that Jesus is returning. Okay, But one of the texts that preterists and even partial preterists will hang on to try to talk about a 70 AD of fulfillment of the Olivet Discourse is found in Matthew 10:23. And here, let me show you the saying that they'll they'll kind of focus on. Matthew 10, 23, it's, Jesus says, But whenever they persecute you in one city, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not finish going through the cities of Israel until the Son of Man comes. Now, what the preterists do with that is they say, Aha! Certainly, Jesus' disciples have to be still alive when the Son of Man comes. In fact, they won't even finish going through the cities of Israel until he comes. Therefore, there has to be a 70 AD fulfillment. That's what they'll argue. Now, the problem with that is they don't recognize that, in fact, in, in, Israelites, in Israel's history, they never do fully repent during the church age. Okay, so what this is referring to in actuality is this is really speaking to the obduracy, which is the term for the stubbornness of Israel. Meaning that through the entire church age, Israel will never come to faith in the Messiah. They will not come to faith in the Messiah until the 70th week of Daniel, until the parousia, the return of Christ. That's when they're going to come to faith. Now, how do I know that? Well, again, here's my bullet point. Israel will never be fully evangelized, but they are brought to faith at Christ's parousia. Now, remember, what did I say the parousia was? The last seven years. Okay, remember the days plural of the Son of Man is synonymous with the parousia of the Son of Man. It's the last seven years. That's when they're going to come to faith. And how can we prove that? Well, Paul says as much in Romans 11, 25 through 26. Notice he says, For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery. Stop there. A mystery is something that was formally concealed, 
but later by the apostle is revealed. Why? Because he is a spokesman for God. This is revelation that we're being given from God by the apostle Paul. Okay, so it's no longer a mystery now. Why? Because it's been revealed to us. Notice he says, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation. He doesn't want us Gentiles to be arrogant. That a partial hardening has happened to Israel until. Notice the until, meaning it's not going to last until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Stop there. When will the fullness of the Gentiles come in? At the end of the church age. Okay, when, when is that day? We have no idea. Is it five minutes from now? Five years from now? 500 years from now? We don't know. We have no idea. It could be next month, could be next week, could be tomorrow. We have no idea. But at some day, someday, the Lord knows, the fullness of the Gentiles comes in and then the parousia comes, the 70th week of Daniel. And that's why in verse 26, he says, and so all Israel will be saved just as it is written. So now he's describing how they're going to be saved. And he's citing right from Isaiah 59, 20, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. Dear ones, I talked about this in a previous message. Do you remember I mentioned that originally Isaiah 59 20 says that the Redeemer, the Deliverer, will come to Zion? Well, why is the Apostle Paul saying here that the Deliverer will come from Zion? Is he just playing fast and loose with our Old Testament? No. He's making a point. He's using Isaiah 59 20 to talk about the second coming of Christ. And he deliberately chooses from because the reference to Zion here is not the earthly Zion, but the heavenly one. So literally he is saying the deliverer will come from heaven. He'll remove ungodliness from Jacob. So now you see that Israel's salvation is connected to the Messiah's return from where? From heaven. Let me prove to you that certainly Zion is the heavenly Jerusalem from where Jesus is bodily reigning and he's seated at the right hand of God. In fact, we know this from the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 12, 22. Here, listen to what he, the writer of Hebrews says to us as believers, the, the partakers of the new covenant, listen to the glory that we have. He says, but you, that is the partakers of the new covenant, you have come to Mount Zion. Okay, now notice that's the same Zion Paul's referring to. And what is it? He says, and to the city of the living God. Stop there. Mount Zion is the city of the living God. What is it? It's the heavenly Jerusalem and to the myriads of angels. Dear ones, that's exactly how Paul's using Zion. It's the heavenly Jerusalem. Who currently is seated at the right hand of God in the heavenly Jerusalem at Zion? Jesus is. But he's going to come from there and he's going to save all Israel by bringing them to faith. That happens in the last three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week. That's the point that's being made in Revelation 11 and 12. That's the whole point. So at the end of the battle, when all the nations surround and try to wipe out Jerusalem, who returns to wipe out the enemies? Messiah does. That happens at the end of the 70th week of Daniel. Let's ask ourselves in 70 AD, did Jesus return to wipe out the enemies surrounding Jerusalem? No, Jerusalem got wiped out. Why? Because 70 AD was part of the time of the Gentiles. What kind of nonsense is this from preterism that says, oh no, all this happened in 70 AD? No, this destroys people's faith. Why? Because if they say, hey, it all happened in 70 AD, then what's the great future blessed hope? No, dear ones, it didn't happen in 70 AD. The Apostle Paul is telling us that Israel will come to faith and be saved when the Messiah returns from the heavenly Jerusalem, from Zion. So the idea then is that Jesus is saying is, hey, you're not even going to finish going through the cities of Israel until the Son of Man comes, the point being is they'll never be evangelized this side of the return of Christ. You can work your whole life to evangelize Israel, and I assure you, from Matthew 10, 23, they will never during the church age be fully evangelized and come to faith until the parousia, the return of the deliverer from the heavenly Jerusalem. That's when it's going to happen. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't witness to them. Goodness, no, we should. Okay, because why? Because God is building his church. Jews and Gentiles are repenting, coming to faith. They're going to be partakers of the kingdom and those alone who repent and believe in Christ. But the point is the plan for national Israel is not that they come during the time of the Gentiles, 
but after the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. It's so obvious. That's what the scripture is teaching us. Okay, so again, this doesn't make any sense to say, well, that means because they won't finish going through the cities of Israel until the Son of Man comes, that in fact, the events of the parousia have to happen in 70 AD. Jesus is talking about the stubbornness of Israel. They'll be so stubborn that they will not repent ultimately until he comes. That's exactly what the Apostle Paul is teaching here. Okay, now let's go on to the next big passage that preterists will use to try to claim the events of the Olivet Discourse had to happen in 70 AD, and that is Matthew 26, 28, where Jesus says, Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his glory. Notice the logic of the preterists. They will say, aha, notice in red it says, there are some who are standing here, namely Jesus' disciples, who are not going to die until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So they, re they reason, well, my goodness, they have to be, still be alive. Therefore, Jesus must come in his kingdom in 70 AD, while at least some of them are still alive. That's the logic that they derive from this text. The problem with that is that every single synoptic gospel that this text is used, where Jesus says there are some who are standing here, immediately after he talks about the Son of Man coming in his kingdom or his glory, he mentions the Mount of Transfiguration. The Mount of Transfiguration is a foreshadowing of the parousia of Christ. It is like a down payment showing that indeed Jesus will one day be the one who reigns upon the earth. Okay, that's the idea. Now, how do we know that? Well, notice here the very next verses. These are the very next verses in the book of Matthew. Matthew 17, 1 through 2. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun and his garments became as white as light. By the way, I want you to see here that immediately those who were standing here, that would be Peter, James, and John, they did see Jesus transfigured in his glory before them. And again, this is a foreshadowing of Christ coming in his glory. In fact, Peter will use in 2 Peter 1, the transfiguration is proof that Christ is coming again to return to the earth to set up an earthly kingdom. He uses that very Mount of Transfiguration experience. Okay, how do we know that? Because he cites what the Heavenly Father says. This is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Okay, so they had the voice from heaven affirming that they had the right interpretation. Jesus has to return. Uh, what about the book of Mark? Well, notice Mark 9, 1 through 2. It says, And Jesus was saying to them, Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming, at the, excuse me, until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Very much identical to what we see in Matthew 16. But notice it says, six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John. Again, same as Matthew here. And what happened? He brought, brought them up on a high mountain by themselves and he was transfigured before them. Okay, so the foreshadowing of Christ coming in his kingdom, notice here the Son of Man coming in his kingdom, is the transfiguration. Okay, so that's how, and by the way, we see the same thing in Luke 9, 27, where he, Jesus says there'll be some who don't taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in the kingdom. And then immediately in 9, 28, he get into the Mount of Transfiguration. So in all three synoptic gospels, the phrase, there are some those who are standing here who will not taste death until, until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. In every instance, the Mount of Transfiguration happens immediately after. Why? Because that's a foreshadowing of the Christ coming in his kingdom. Okay, so again, why is the Preterist saying, well, this must mean it happens, the coming of the Christ in 70 AD? They're not reading the text as the biblical writers intended it. The biblical writers want you to see the transfiguration as the fulfillment of those standing there that would see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom, not some later event. That's why all three of them place the Mount of Transfiguration right after that saying. 
Okay, let's go to another one. What about Matthew 26, 64? Here, Jesus is before the council. He's being questioned by the high priest. And if you recall, the high priest asks him a question, but Jesus remains silent. Why? Because Jesus fulfills Isaiah 53, 7, just as a sheep is silent before the shears, he will not open his mouth. And so in Matthew 26, 63, here's what, it says, it says, but Jesus kept silent and the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the son of God. Now, what is Jesus' response to that? Well, let's pull it up. Here's Matthew 26, 64. It says, Jesus said to him, you have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you hereafter, you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Okay, now I want to talk about this. What the preterist does with this is they try to claim when Jesus says, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. They say, well, wait a minute. That must happen within the lifespan of the high priest that is speaking to Jesus. Therefore, this had to happen within the time period of 70 A.D., that's the logic that they are trying to d derive from this text. Well, it's very interesting. Let's unpack what the text is actually saying. Notice the term hereafter. The, the term in Greek there, apoharti, literally is from now on. From now on, you're going to see what? You're going to see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power. Okay, so that's a fulfillment of Psalm 110.1. And coming on the clouds of heaven which is Daniel 7.13. Now, why is that important? Well, let me explain why I think it's important. Jesus just cites from Psalm 110.1 in Daniel 7.13. I want you to think about it this way. In Psalm 110.1, that happens at the very beginning of the church age. In other words, Jesus ascends after his death, burial, and resurrection. He ascends and he's seated at the right hand of God. Okay, what happens at the end when Jesus returns? That, that is at the end of the church age. Well, he comes on the clouds of glory. And so what we have here then, in a very real way, is these passages each bracket the inner advent age from the first coming to the second coming. Okay, now again, don't, don't miss it. Psalm 110.1, Jesus fulfills that at his ascension. When is Jesus going to fulfill Daniel 7.13? At his return. At his return. So you have a bracketing of the entire inner advent age. Why does Jesus cite those two things? The idea then is that the leadership of Israel will have to deal with Christ on a whole new level. The ascended Christ who is seated at the right hand of God who's coming again in power. They're not going to have old Jesus to kick around anymore. Okay, they're going to be dealing with the resurrected Son of Man, who is their judge. That's the point that Jesus is making, is that, yes, his kingdom is not of this world, as he says. But when he ascends and is seated at the right hand of God, and until he comes through the inner advent age, remember, that's bracketing the whole thing, the leadership of Israel is going to be dealing with the ascended, resurrected, victorious, reigning Christ. That's who they're going to be dealing with. That's his point. Not that he had to come by 70 AD. Okay, that's why he brackets the entire inner advent age. Psalm 110.1 is ascension. Daniel 7.13, his return. That's the idea that Jesus is conveying here. They're not dealing with the lowly, humiliated Christ. Now the leadership of Israel is going to have to deal with the exalted Christ. The one who is ascended, seated at the right hand of God. The one who is returning in great power to rule and reign upon the earth. That's who they're contending with. That's Jesus' point, clearly, I think, in this text. Okay. Now, by the way, no person physically saw the resurrected Christ in 70 AD. Okay. So if you're going to say, well, this is Jesus and it's about his coming. And it's about his coming and therefore this has to happen during the lifespan of the high priest, you will see. Therefore, 
This has to do with the coming of Christ, therefore this has to happen in 70 AD. That's the logic of the preterist. Realize Jesus never returned in 70 AD in his resurrected body. Now, how do we know that? Notice I cited 1 Corinthians 15, 8. There, Paul says that he, the Apostle Paul, was the last of all to see Jesus Christ raised from the dead. The last of all means a last in a series. Okay, so the next time that anyone sees Christ bodily raised from the dead is going to be the believers at the rapture. Okay, did the rapture and the resurrection occur in 70 AD? Well, of course not. And if you believe that, you're a heretic. You don't belong to Christ. You deny a core aspect of the gospel, the future bodily return of Christ and the future resurrection. So why are partial preterists and preterists latching onto this saying, well, this all happened in 70 AD? It's nonsense. They're not reading the text for what Jesus is saying. Okay? Now, let's keep moving on. I want to talk about full preterism as heresy. Just two slides and we'll close. Why is full preterism heresy? Well, think of it this way. 2 Timothy 2, 17 through 18. Remember those two jokers, Hymenaeus and Philetus? They were causing trouble at the church at Ephesus. Notice what Paul talks. He's saying this to Timothy, who's a pastor, who's supposed to guard the flock. Notice Paul instructs him. He says, and their talk will spread like gain green. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus. Notice verse 18, men who have gone astray from the truth. Okay, stop there. How are Hymenaeus and Philetus described by Paul? Men who've gone astray from the truth. What did they do to go away from the truth? Saying that the resurrection has already taken place and they upset the faith of some. Brothers and sisters, if the parousia happened in 70 AD, the parousia is when the resurrection happens. Well, that means the resurrection happened in 70 AD. How are the preterists not making the identical error and heresy that Hymenaeus and Philetus are? How are they not? How are they not making the same error? Well, of course they are. Okay, so think of it this simply. Let's do a little categorical syllogism. The parousia is when the resurrection happens. So says the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. So he says also in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So when does the resurrection happen? At the parousia of Christ. Okay, well, let's go to the second assertion here. Our second premise, the parousia has already happened. That would be the premise of the preterist and specifically the full preterist. Okay, well, if the parousia is when the resurrection happens and the parousia has already happened, therefore what? What's our necessary conclusion? The resurrection has already happened. That's what preterists are saying. Well, that's exactly what Hymenaeus and Philetus said. They said the resurrection has already taken place, and they're those who had gone, what? Astray from the truth. Guess what the full preterists are? They are those who have gone astray from the truth. It's error. It's evil. It's sinful. It's wickedness. It's rebellion against Christ. That's what this is. Okay, now, what's sad is many people don't see that. But I want to point it out. It's obvious. Every single person should say, if you're a full preterist and you believe that the parousia occurred in 70 AD, I have no, no commonality with you. The gospel isn't just what Christ has done. It's also what he's going to do. That he's bodily returning to raise us up. Full preterism denies that. And so we should see that very clearly. Let's ask ourselves the question, are the partial preterists saying that we have two parousias? If there's a partial parousia in 70 AD, as many partial preterists must believe, because they believe that much of the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 is fulfilled in 70 AD, are they claiming that there's two parousias? Because these are the same uh, eschatology teachers who will say, well, how, Eric, can you believe in a rapture and a return of Christ that are separated by seven years? Well, they have two parousias that are separated by at least 2,000 years now. Are you with me? So don't, don't fall for the partial preterist, oh, you can't have a rapture separated by seven years followed by a return of Christ. I believe that's all part of one parousia, but they have to have two parousias separated by thousands of years from 70 AD until whenever the Lord returns. It's nonsense reject preterism. I think it should be thrown out. It doesn't have any merit. Okay, 
Let's ask ourselves, what's your blessed hope? You and I are living for the blessed hope of a return of Jesus Christ. Let's ask the question, is your blessed hope the destruction of the Jews in 70 AD? Was that the blessed hope? Do you get up every morning and say, oh yes, the Jews were wiped out in 70 AD. Hallelujah. Well, that seems awfully strange to me, but that's the logic of partial preterism and certainly full preterism. No, dear ones, that's not the blessed hope. Is your blessed hope the return of Christ to give his people a resurrected body? That's my hope. That's always been the blessed hope of the church. 2 Thessalonians 2.8, here the apostle Paul says, then that lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to the end by the appearance of his parousia. Again, at the parousia, not only are we raised from the dead, but the Antichrist comes to his end. That's at the end of the seven years, the end of the parousia. Okay, now why am I mentioning that? Well, Notice 1 Timothy 6.14. Here, the Apostle Paul says that you keep, that is believers, keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. The appearing is synonymous with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Did that all happen in 70 AD? Are we free then not to keep the commandment? Because after all, the preterist argues that the appearing of our Lord happened in 70 AD. Right? It's absurd. I'm just showing you absurdities. Should we just keep Christ's command until 70 AD? Of course not. Think about Titus 2.13. Here's our blessed hope. We are looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. The appearing of Christ in the future to raise us up is the blessed hope. It's never been the destruction of the Jews in 70 AD. Brothers and sisters, think about it. Preterism and partial preterism, they really have nothing to offer. They're exegetically suspect. I've showed you that this generation, they don't understand that correctly. I showed you the phrases today. Those who are standing here, certainly those are those who are at the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John. I showed you exegetically. We talked about historically. The book of Revelation could not be written prior to the reign of Domitian. No, all of this disproves preterism. Let's jettison it. Let's get rid of it. The blessed hope is not the destruction of the Jews, dear ones. It's the return of Christ at his parousia to raise us up. That's the good news of the gospel. A good news that's not just about what Christ has done, but about Christ coming again, what he will do. We'll see you next time on End Times 2.0.